The year is 1990. Nintendo has just received the latest Q Ratings report, a long-running popularity poll that ranks celebrities and fictional characters by weighing their popularity against their familiarity. And the latest results show that Mario now has a higher Q score than Mickey Mouse. This in itself was not unusual. Characters had overtaken Mickey before, only to eventually drop back down again. What was unusual is that this time the character was from Japan. But how did a toy company in Kyoto end up with a Brooklyn plumber as its mascot? Critical Kate is on the case. Brought to you by patrons like Billy Voda, Ben Golis, Kay Savitz, and Cinnamon Challenge Memory. Nintendo Headquarters, 1981 Game designer Gunpei Yokoi is overseeing the next wave in the Game & Watch series, a popular line of handheld games with LCD screens, when his boss, Hiroshi Yamauchi, comes to him with an assignment. Design a game that will bail out Nintendo of America. Nintendo had been making arcade games since the 1970s, but its American distribution had always been handled by American companies. Nintendo of America was established in 1980 for the purpose of doing it themselves. Yamauchi appointed his son-in-law, Minoru Arakawa, to head up the company in New York City. The first two games from Nintendo of America were shown at the Big Coin Op trade show in October, the same trade show where Midway demonstrated an unassuming little game called Pac-Man. In Hellafire, you played as a submarine from which you fired missiles at helicopters while dodging projectiles. It was nothing special in terms of gameplay, but visually it was a bit unusual thanks to an obscure graphical trick that filled the background with smooth gradients instead of flat colors. Radar Scope was even more visually impressive. On top of being the first game to include a damage meter or health bar, it was also the first game to depict a Space Invaders or Galaxian-style shootout from a 3D perspective, with distant ships gradually growing larger as they approached. Compare this to Space Firebird, a third Nintendo game at the show that was already being distributed by Sega Gremlin. Although the gameplay had a bit more variety than Radar Scope, Visually, it looked no different from any other top-down shoot-'em-up released that year. In Japan, Space Firebird was a moderate success, making it as high as the number three spot in Game Machine Magazine's weekly operator polls. Radar Scope, on the other hand, was able to reach the number two spot, making it ever so slightly the more successful of the two. But in America, it was a different story. Here, Space Firebird was only a minor success, getting only as far as number 14 in Replay Magazine's monthly operator polls, while Radar Scope, possibly due to Nintendo of America not yet being as well-connected as Sega Gremlin, didn't chart at all. Of the 3,000 units Arakawa shipped from Japan, less than a third sold through during the game's crucial first months. Facing such a devastating blow, Arakawa got on the phone to his father-in-law with a request, who in turn went to Gunpei Yokoi with an assignment. Design a game that will bail out Nintendo of America. But there's a catch. The game has to run on the same hardware as Radar Scope, so that Nintendo of America can convert their warehouse full of old games into this new one. The only problem is, Yokoi is kind of already busy, but luckily he recently began mentoring the company's graphic artist into becoming a game designer and decides to put him on the task. His name is Shigeru Miyamoto. Miyamoto is working on Game & Watch designs, the next wave of which is going to include iconic characters like Mickey Mouse and Popeye, properties Nintendo has been licensing on toys and playing cards since the 1960s. Miyamoto was initially working on the Popeye Game & Watch, so when the Radar Scope project comes down the line, they figure, why not make a Popeye video game? 
Yokoi thinks the setting should be a construction site, inspired by the iconic sleepwalking olive sequence that was recycled numerous times by Popeye's own animators. Yokoi's favorite bit is near the end of the short, when it looks like Olive is about to walk off a girder, only for new ones to keep swinging into place, a concept it appears he's already explored in the game Manhole. Miyamoto plays around with an idea where the girders become elevators, a concept later explored in Mario's Cement Factory, but for now they settle on a concept involving rolling barrels. This early sketch was discovered by gaming historian Norm Caruso while going through old court files. The moment I saw it, I wanted to see if I could translate these blurry Xeroxed graphing paper drawings into finalized pixel art, but almost immediately I discovered a problem. The Brutus design only worked if I increased the number of pixels, which would make him a giant in comparison to the other characters. Miyamoto must have realized this as well, because by the end of March, he replaced Brutus with a giant ape. Donkey Kong was originally going to fight Popeye. The inspiration for Donkey Kong was clearly the movie King Kong, but was the inspiration direct or indirect? Popeye fought a giant ape just nine months after the original movie. But another possibility is that Miyamoto had simply been playing a lot of Crazy Climber, Japan's third most popular arcade game of 1980. In 1997, Miyamoto's ape sketch was published in a Japanese tech journal called Bit Magazine for a feature on the making of Donkey Kong written by one of its programmers. Hirohisa Komanome is an employee of Ikegami Tsushinki, a TV broadcast equipment manufacturer that had programmed all of Nintendo's video arcade games up to this point. Ikegami assembles a project team of four software engineers, including Komanome, with a tight projected turnaround of just two and a half months. Their first task is to evaluate Miyamoto's pitch and to brainstorm possible improvements. The biggest change to come out of this first week of brainstorming is the concept of a jump button. The initial game pitch is little more than a ladder climbing game in the style of Space Panic, but Miyamoto's take doesn't even involve digging holes. Instead, you mainly avoid danger by climbing ladders, which the programming team feels is a little too passive. Someone points out that if barrels were being rolled at Popeye, he'd likely just jump over them. The team would also like to see more variety, since at this point the game is merely a single repeating stage with only an occasional special stage to break things up. Not that this was unusual. In 1981, most games are still just a single stage, because the primary goal of an arcade game is to achieve a high score, rather than to reach any sort of ending. But the programming team has been playing a popular new game called Scramble. This extremely influential side-scrolling shooter was revolutionary at the time for featuring five distinct stages that each required a different strategy. This encouraged players to try to get just a little bit further every time they played in the hope of finding out what happens next. This primary objective is spelled out on an opening screen that asks, how far can you invade our scramble system? A message Donkey Kong will mimic by asking, how high can you get? But if the game's going to have multiple stages and a jump button, the programming team feels that the theme of one of these stages should be jumping. This gives Miyamoto a reason to bring back the vertical elevators, which he previously felt might have been too difficult for a player to walk onto, but now the player can jump. The resulting level design will instantly invent the entire platform genre. But soon, a new problem arises. Popeye has to be replaced. The reason, according to both Komanome and Yokoi, was a combination of the difficulty in making a 16 by 16 pixel sprite look like Popeye, but also unspecified licensing issues. Instead, Nintendo will roll Popeye into a less time-sensitive project, one that won't be shackled to ill-fitting hardware. 
This new Popeye game will utilize a technique previously seen in Nintendo Sky Skipper that allows them to draw large character art at twice the normal resolution at the expense of the background art which needs to be greatly simplified. In the meantime, however, Miyamoto needs to figure out who in the world is going to be fighting this giant ape. And the clock is ticking. Since the game is set on a construction site, Miyamoto concludes that the most obvious solution is to make the player character a blue-collar worker. As an added bonus, dressing him in work overalls helps to define the shape of his arms when he runs, while giving him a mustache helps to define the shape of his nose. Miyamoto is so pleased with the results that he immediately begins picturing the character appearing in a wide variety of scenarios, the same way that comic artists like Osamu Tezuka would frequently recast characters in different stories as if they were actors. Miyamoto wants to name his character Mr. Video, but when the cabinet ships to Nintendo of America, which has since relocated from New York to Seattle, the English version of the instruction card dubs him Jumpman, likely in reaction to the recent success of Pac-Man. However, Arakawa and co. quickly take to calling him Little Mario, in reference to their new Seattle landlord, Mario Sigali. Within months, they insert the name into the description text of the American Flyer. And that's how Mario became Mario. But even though he's now an original creation, he still retains a few subtle traces of Popeye, such as a large nose, a cleft chin, and a lumpy hat. Yet at the same time, he also appears to borrow from Mickey Mouse, most notably his red pants with two large white buttons on the front. Which raises an interesting question. When Miyamoto realized that he couldn't use Popeye, why didn't he just replace him with Mickey, a character who is a lot easier to render in just a few pixels? For that matter, why didn't they go with Mickey from the start? Why Popeye? Upon further investigation, I've arrived at two possible theories. Theory number one, they didn't have the worldwide rights. Game & Watch Mickey Mouse exists in two flavors, the normal version and a generic version called Egg. The reason? Nintendo only had the rights to sell Mickey Mouse products in Japan, so Egg was created for the international market while they worked on securing a worldwide license. The process must have gone a lot more quickly than they were expecting, because both games were available in North America at Christmas time, though Egg was apparently produced in much smaller quantities, making it quite rare. It makes me wonder if the reason Mickey had a plan B was due to Nintendo's previous experience with Game & Watch Popeye, which took half a year from concept to completion, when most of the games took only two months, perhaps an example of how the licensing pipeline can be fraught with delays. The development of Donkey Kong would have been no exception. What if the real reason they had to drop Popeye from the game is that Yokoi simply realized that if they were really in a hurry to crank out a radar scope replacement, a licensed game just wasn't going to be an option. But none of this explains why the following year they still decided to do a Popeye game when a Mickey Mouse game using that same graphical technique would have been absolutely huge in America. Why Popeye? Theory number two? They just really fucking loved Popeye. Three, two, one, go! On April 15th, 1983, Tokyo Disneyland opened in Japan. According to Nikkei Marketing Journal, this resulted in a sudden surge in popularity for Mickey Mouse, who had fallen behind more popular characters like Bambi and Pinocchio. You can see this play out within the handful of Nintendo playing card catalogs that are viewable on the blog Before Mario. In the early 60s, there was a fair amount of Mickey, as well as Donald, Bambi, and Lady and the Tram. But by 1975, there was no more Mickey, just Bambi and Lady and the Tram. And then, in 1983, the year of Tokyo Disneyland, a sudden explosion of Mickey. Popeye was also featured in the 1960s and 1983 catalogs, and also missing in 1975. But if a catalog from the late 70s ever surfaces, I strongly believe Popeye will be in there, 
because in the second half of the 70s, Popeye suddenly experienced a surprise resurgence. During this period, he became, among other things, the spokesman for Ikari Sauce, the mascot for Japan Airlines Ski Vacations, the namesake of a fashion magazine for City Boys, and the subject of a hit disco song by a novelty group called Spinach Power, which raises the unlikely question, could it be possible that, for a brief period of time between 1976 and 1982, Popeye was actually more popular in Japan than Mickey Mouse? Or, to ask an even more important question, why a Popeye? So let's talk about Popeye. 